Good morning, Emmanuel family. I welcome you to this Sunday service, January the 16th. Whether you are accessing this service on your phone or uh, with your computer or a tablet, whether you are worshiping Sunday morning, afternoon, evening, or some other day entirely, whether you are alone or with other people, I hope that you know that you are loved and you are valued and you are welcome. It might feel disappointing to some of us that we've had to return to recorded services, especially after having had some time together worshiping in person. I want to acknowledge that loss. But at the same time, I also express my gratitude to our church leadership for carefully and thoughtfully going through a process that uh, came to this decision. To me, it's an expression of love that we care so deeply for each other that we're willing to make these sacrifices in order to keep each other safe. One of our scripture texts, which we will hear later this morning, comes from Hebrews chapter 10, where the Apostle Paul encourages us to draw near to God with a sincere heart and to not give up meeting together. As I reflected on that text in our context today, I'm also grateful that we have the technology and the expertise that allows us to do exactly that as we worship God together in this way online. So I want to thank Joel Brandt for lending us his talents again. Joel, you are a gift to our congregation. It's important to remember too that we are not alone, that we have each other, that there are ways that we can stay connected to each other and ultimately God is with each one of us. He knows us intimately, and God knows our every need. So take heart, friends. I do believe that we will get through this, and we'll get through it well, if we look to God each day with a sincere heart, and that we look out for each other. And one of the small bonuses of doing our services this way is that at least we can see our whole faces again because we don't have to wear masks. We are beginning a new worship theme today called Biblical Images of the Church in Mission. And today's theme is People of the Way. With that image in mind, I invite you to join me in this call to worship. Happy are those who walk in God's ways. Blessed are those who observe God's commandments. Faithful are those whose eyes are fixed on righteousness. Joyful are those whose hearts are filled with praise. Come, let us love the Lord our God. We come to worship the one who leads us in the ways of life. Let us pray together. Holy God, you call us together to reflect on your word and our life in your world. Be with us now as we sing and pray and learn together that we may hear your voice and understand your way. This we pray through Jesus, who is the way. Amen. Our first song today is a sung version of Psalm 119 with words by the U.S. poet Jean Jansen. I long for your commandments, your judgments, all are good. Um, according to our records, uh, we and Emmanuel have not sung this song ever before. So Lori will play it through uh, once first on the piano and then we'll join in to sing all three verses. I long for your commandments. Our comfort to my spirit is needed in the night, my 
Get up off the couch and move around a bit. Kids, uh, maybe you can encourage the adults to move, um, to march and pray and dance in the light of God. We are marching 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 in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching, we are marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are praying 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 in the light of God. We are praying, praying, we are praying, we are praying, we are praying in the light of the light of God. We are praying, praying, we are praying, we are praying in the light of God. We are dancing 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 in the light of the We are dancing, we are dancing, we are dancing, we are dancing in the light of the We are dancing, we are dancing, we are dancing, we are dancing in the light of the Good morning, everybody. It's Rachel, your family pastor, talking to you from our new kids' church room, which I'm so excited to have all of the kids in when we come back in person. Um, it's pretty awesome, but right now it feels really empty because I'm the only one here. I have a little story to uh, read to you all today, and it is about Jesus when Jesus was a kid. So here we go. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, and when Jesus was 12 years old, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple. They had to travel there by walking, and so they walked with many of their friends and family. There were 
many people in Jerusalem, and it was very crowded. Jesus had a good time there with friends and with family, but when it was time to go home, Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph just thought that he was walking with his friends, but that night they went to look for him and couldn't find him, so they got so worried. Jesus was lost. Mary and Joseph hurried back to Jerusalem. For three days, they hunted for Jesus, and at last they found him in the temple. He was listening to the wise teachers there and asking them all of his questions. Mary said, we've been so worried about you. But Jesus said, I had to come to my father's house. Jesus knew that he was God's son. He had been talking to the teachers about God, but he obeyed Mary and Joseph and went home with them. I don't know about you, but I always picture Jesus fully grown up, which is silly because he was a human being on earth. We know from Christmas stories that he was born as a baby and the only way to get from baby to grown up is growing up. You got to do every age and so did Jesus. So then it makes me wonder what was Jesus like when he was a kid? This story tells us one thing about Jesus, which is that he liked to learn. He went to the temple, which was like the church, and he found the wisest people and he asked all his questions. So today, since we can't be together in kids' church, I wanted to give you some questions to start thinking about while you're at home. Um, so yeah, try to think about, try to imagine what was Jesus like when he was a kid? Think about how old you are. Maybe you're seven. What was seven-year-old Jesus like? And what was it like to be seven growing up in Jerusalem, in Nazareth, on the other side of the world 2,000 years ago? I think that there was probably a lot that was different from how you're growing up right now, but maybe some things were similar. So that's what we're gonna think about for today. Um, and I am just so excited for you to all be back here in person with me in hopefully a few weeks. Um, so I hope you have a happy Sunday and I'll see you soon. Bye. As we uh, prepare to enter into a time of prayer, I invite you to take time to look through the bulletin and note the prayer requests that are listed there. We will begin our time of prayer with a moment of silence. And I invite you to take this time to offer up your own prayers, the things that weigh on your heart, the things for which you are grateful, the things that give you joy. As we pray, you will see some images come up on the screen and these are simply there to give us a visual focus to meditate on. Friends, let us pray confident in the knowledge that God hears our prayers and will answer. So let us begin now in prayer with a moment of silence. God of all comfort, in this ongoing time of pandemic, we pray. When we aren't sure and the way seems unclear, help us be calm. When information comes from all sides and we are confused, help us to discern. When fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, Help us to slow down to find your presence. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distanced. 
Help us to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. For those who are sick and those who are grieving, we pray. For caregivers of all kinds who show up every day, we pray. For decision makers and leaders who must guide us in these difficult times, we pray. For all who are affected, all around the world, we pray for comfort, for safety, for health, for resources, for wisdom, for wholeness. Lord, we are your people, the people of the way, a way of living that seeks to serve and care for our neighbors. May we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked and house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel they are alone. May we bring peace where there is conflict, faith where there is doubt, love where there is fear, hope where there is despair. Help us, O oh God, that we might help each other. In the love of the Creator, in the name of the Healer, in the life of the Holy Spirit that is in all and with all, we pray. Amen. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country and your people. Leave your father's family. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will put a curse on anyone who calls down a curse on you. All nations on earth will be blessed because of you. Hello, Emmanuel. Um, I'm going to be reading here from UBC, my dorm here. And uh, the scripture reading for today is Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hello, Emmanuel. Well, here we are again, online, with the pandemic in another wave, in an, another atmospheric river descending. But it's uh, good to uh, be together uh, virtually. I just finished reading a book entitled The uh, Baby and the Bathwater, uh, Aspiration and Reality in the Life of the Church by uh, Robert uh, Jack Suderman, the former executive uh, secretary of our denomination. Uh, for your information, for those who uh, may not be familiar, he's not closely related to our new pastor, Rod Suderman. You can ask him about that sometime. The reality we face in the Western world is that the church is in decline and many people are leaving the church because they're discouraged that it is increasingly irrelevant to addressing the problems of the present generation and of our world. Uh, Jack Suderman uh, urges us not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The church is the baby, and his concern is that we are abandoning the church, along with the dirty bathwater of all that has been and is wrong with the church. Now, there's lots of reasons to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Christian church has either directed, aided, or abetted in the slaughtering of Muslims in the Crusades, the forcing of Africans into slavery and putting indigenous children into residential schools in Canada. And we can't just say that they didn't know any better in those days. I don't blame people for not wanting anything to do with the church. Catholics and Protestants, mainline and evangelical, all have been a part of this. And Mennonites have not been any better, and they've often just isolated themselves completely. Uh, when self-preservation is basically the goal. Uh, look at any church budget of any denomination today and see how much is spent on staff and programs just to keep the institution going. This has led to a clear separation between congregational life and the calling to mission. Whenever interest in mission did arise in the history of the church, it was often carried out by Christians on the fringes outside the formal structures of the church. In Catholicism, it was uh, the missionary monastic orders. In Protestantism, it was missionary agencies. And both of these sometimes had very un-Jesus-like methods. And this resulted in impoverishment of the church and a deformation of mission. Unfortunately, there are lots of reasons to throw out the baby with the bathwater. But in his book, uh, Jack Suderman urges us not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. As a good pastoral leader, he does not offer any grand structural solutions, uh, but simply leads us back to the pictures of the church in the Bible. What God intends the church to be, what we aspire the church to be, a place of healing and hope for the brokenness of the world. This is what we want to do in our short little preaching series over the next seven Sundays. Rather than offering a blueprint or a new system for how we can be a better church, we will simply look at seven biblical pictures of the church. Now, we're at an important turning point in the life of our congregation. It's now more than three years ago that our long-term lead pastor resigned. Since then, all of our church staff have moved on, other than our office administrator. Thanks for being our rock of stability, Joel. We have also collectively, along with the rest of the world, experienced a viral pandemic for, it's been dragging on for two years. Over these, Two and three years, we've experienced the death of more than a dozen of our core church members. Our church is changing. Last summer and fall in BC, we experienced climate change up close with 
uh, record heat and fires in summer, record rain and floods in the fall, and we had to cancel our last gathering of 2021 due to record cold and snow. Now, we're back to online services. No one could blame us for being a little bit discouraged. All these things together have affected our ability to be the church. However, there are also signs of hope. We hired Rachel Navarro as our new family pastor last summer. And in September, we began gathering again. And Rachel helped us work on an intergenerational communal art piece during the fall. It was a remarkable sign of us working together. It now hangs on the wall above the front doors to remind us of our journey together through the wilderness of the past few years. We are still a people. We are the church together. Let's not be too quick to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Our new lead pastor, Rod Suderman, will begin his ministry in a few weeks. He already worked with me to discern uh, with the Spirit what we need to be hearing at this time. So we hope that this short uh, series will help uh, inspire us to be the church. The church is not a building, but a living, breathing, multidimensional, diverse community of fallible people that experience and communicate God's mission of shalom salvation for the world. And we ask ourselves, how are we living this mission? Would anyone in the world or in Abbotsford miss us if we cease to exist as a church? There's some Old Testament background, of course, to the New Testament uh, images of the church. In the Bible, the people of God originated out of their calling to serve God's mission in the world. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3, uh, Yahweh called Abraham out of Ur, saying, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. But note that this great nation did not exist for itself. All peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Israel, strugglers, as God's people were later called, often forgot this and they thought they were special in and of themselves. And this is why the prophets came, to call God's people back to who they were supposed to be. The book of Jonah is a good example of this. The book ends with these words to Jonah who represents Israel. All you care about is your own comfort. When I care about the 120,000 people in Nineveh who don't even know right from wrong. I even care about all the animals. The church is the continuing people of God. And the church is not here for its own sake. But its purpose is to carry out God's mission of bringing shalom to all people and to all creation. William Temple, the 19th century theologian, said the church is an institution that exists for the sake of its non-members. The purpose of the church is not self-preservation. The purpose of the church is to re reach out and bless others. We are not here for ourselves. The church is to be an example of what God desires for all humanity. Oh my, you say, we are so far from it. Yes, there is obviously some distance between the aspiration and the reality. It's tempting then to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And this is why this book was written and why we need this sermon series. I hope that the biblical pictures that we will be exploring uh, each Sunday will inspire us to be who we are called to be. We're using uh, John Driver's uh, book, uh, Images of the Church in Mission, as our uh, inspiration for our uh, sermons. Uh, he writes in this in the introduction. 
The Bible employs a rich variety of metaphors that illumine our understanding of the identity and mission of the church. Images can communicate a vision with power. They reflect the sense of identity which characterized the early Christian communities. Images also inspire the church and challenge it to live up to its real reason for being. The images we use reflect what we are. They also largely determine what we will become. Both Jack Suderman and John Driver refer to another book uh, first published in 1960 that lists 96 images for the church in the New Testament. A driver chooses 12 images that are particularly dynamic and missional or outward focused. We have chosen seven of these because we have seven Sundays left until Lent. It's not a complete picture, but hopefully these seven pictures are enough for us to get a glimpse of the biblical picture of the church, enough to give us some hope as we begin this new phase of our life together as a church, enough to hang on to that baby as we throw out the old bathwater. So let's look at the first uh, image, the way. This is probably the first image used in the New Testament to describe the church. Followers of the way. <coughs> Excuse me. This uh, self-designation is found numerous times in the book of Acts, and the references are listed here. Acts 9.2 says, those who belonged to the way. In chapter 18 to 25 and 26, Priscilla and Aquila explain the way of God to Apollos. And in Acts 19, 8 and 9, when Paul is preaching, it says that others are refuting the way. And later in chapter 24, verse 14, Paul refers to himself as a follower of the way in his trial before Felix. Church as followers of the way seems to refer back to Jesus in John 14, 6, where Jesus calls himself the way. So if Jesus is the way, then followers of the way are followers of Jesus. Or if we are those who belong to the way, we are those who belong to Jesus. But why is the way chosen as a picture for the church? Again, this has some Old Testament background. Almost all of the New Testament images are always rooted in the Old Testament. In the Hebrew Bible, way comes from hodos, a word that means walk, conduct, or uh, a manner of life uh, consistent with the character of Yahweh, uh, Exodus 20, 18, 20. And so it's primarily a way of life rather than a way to somewhere. Uh, just as in Jesus' parable of the two ways, the narrow way and the wide way are rooted in the Old Testament image of the way. Uh, for example, Joshua 24, verse 15, choose you this day whom you will serve, or choose you this day which way you're going to walk. Uh, like in Psalm uh, chapter 1, uh, the two ways are contrasted, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And so the narrow way uh, is not so much a way to life as a way of life. It is a way to walk, a way to conduct ourselves. Let's look at Jesus the way in John chapter 14. The same can be said for Jesus the way. 
Jesus exemplifies a way of life. Too often we read John 14, 6 as Jesus is the way to life. And so then all I need to do is pray the sinner's prayer and I will have spiritual bliss forevermore. But there is so much more to this image. Jesus is a way of life, the way of love. Eternal life is not just some time in the future. It is a way of life right now. Look at the context of Jesus' statement in John 14, verse 6, if we look back at chapter 13. John 13, 33, uh, Jesus here says to Peter that Peter can't follow where he is going. And again, too often this is interpreted he's going to heaven, Peter can't go with him there. But look at it in context. It's not about a geographic journey to pie in the sky. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, Love one another as I have loved you. This is where Jesus is going. Jesus is going to the cross to ultimately display love. This is the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to love. This is repeated again on the other side of the statement in chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way. Look at chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. That is the commandment to love. The way of Jesus is to love. The Hebrews text that was read for us earlier, chapter 10, verses 19 to 24, picks up on this same theme in verse 20, calling it, calling it a new and living way. Again, look at it as a way of life rather than a way to a location. The location, again, is usually interpreted as being heaven in some kind of spiritual dimension. But again, this reading is out of context. And I would say it's influenced by that ancient heresy called Gnosticism, where body and soul are separated. This would be then be a disembodied life. Rather, this way is opened up by Jesus' own embodiment. Listen back to my Christmas sermon uh, from, from last year to, that explains this whole theme. Hebrews says, a way is open for us through his body, that is, Jesus' body. The way of Jesus is to incarnate love in our everyday lives. The way of Jesus is to put flesh and skin on love. And so it climaxes in verse 24 with an exhortation which makes perfect sense in context. Let us spur one another on to love and good deeds. And if you're not into horsemanship, uh, you may not, or haven't watched Westerns, you may not understand the analogy. Let us spur one another to dig your spurs into the horse, got the horse, gets the horse going. In other words, let's encourage one another to love and good deeds. Again, a way of life, a way of love. To be a church of the way means that we are a church that lives in the way of Jesus, the way of love. Now, this is not rocket science, but love is generally not our default way of living. We tend rather to live in fear. But the Bible says in 1 John 4, verse 18, another wonderful text about love, that perfect love casts out fear. The opposite of love is not hate, as we often assume. The opposite of love is fear. I don't hate anybody, but I am afraid of people who are not like me, who do not think like me. Think of our own present context and the issues facing us. 
We're afraid that indigenous people will take all our houses and land we have worked so hard for if we show love by learning the truth about our history and seeking reconciliation. We are afraid that our church will become a gay club if we show unconditional love by welcoming lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people as full participating members in our congregation. We're afraid that if we build social housing, we'll not have enough parking for our cars, and we're afraid that a smaller sanctuary will not be adequate for big funerals. These are the ways of fear, not the way of love. We are a church of the way, of love. But of course, we're not there yet. We're also a church on the way. This picture of a church known by the way of Jesus is aspirational and inspirational. It's where the spirit of Jesus wants to take us. It takes time to get there. It's not automatic. There is much menial work to be done. The way of love is not some idyllic, utopian, hippie commune, only in my flower power dreams. And if it does not happen soon enough, well, I'm tempted to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But it takes work, patient work. The way of love involves difficult conversations with different others. The way of love involves dollars and cents, bricks and mortar, coffee stains and paperwork. The way of love might even involve tediously long meetings on Zoom and in person when it is safe. We are a church on the way. Let us spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. Let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Thank you, Gareth, for your message. I invite you, in response to this message, to join me in these words of benediction before we sing our final closing song. In the loving of neighbor and the sharing of love, together we walk in the way. In the celebration of life and the sharing of that life together, together we walk in the way in the caring of the earth and the sharing of her harvest, together we walk in the way. In the welcoming of all people and the sharing of all our talents, together we walk in the way. In the laughter we make and the sharing of the journey, together we walk in the way. In the love of our community, and the sharing of our faith. Together, we walk in the way. I invite you to go in peace as you walk in the way. For our final sending song, William's going to play through the melody once on his cello, and then we'll join in for two times through. <laughs> Shine on you every day, we are sent by God.